Now, can anybody tell me that's younger than 16? What event on the church history calendar are we celebrating today? Yes, Mary. What? Palm Sunday. What is that? What is that about? Mm -hmm. It's called the Triumphal Entry. Um, <clears throat> and the reason it's called Palm Sunday is because they were waving palm branches. That's where we get the Palm Sunday. Thank you, Mary. Matthew 21, and I'm going to read through to verse 17. <clears throat> Let us stand together to hear the word of the Lord. Matthew 21, starting in verse 1 to verse 17. Let me mention before we start here, I was thinking... There's so much that happens this week, and there's, you know, we, we celebrate, you know, Easter in the springtime, and of course you've got Palm Sunday, the Sunday before, and but there's so many events that happened during that week of reality with Jesus when he was here on earth, that you really need to have service at least once a day, maybe twice a day, every day of the week. Um, just to get it all in. And so, I, you know, I was thinking, okay, it's... Uh, so I'm, I'm actually going to go beyond and, and pull from the, the past a little bit of just that one day when he comes right again. Uh, but this is, this is the core uh, set of verses that I want us to look at, at least the springboard. Matthew 21. And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem, and were come to Bethphage, unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway you shall find an ass tied, and a colt with her. Loose them, and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, you shall say, The Lord hath need of them. And straightway he will send them. All this was done, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ass, and a colt of the foal of an ass. <clears throat> and the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the ass and the colt, and put on them their clothes, and they set him thereon, and a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strewed them on the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! And when he was come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And then the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. And when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were sore displeased. And said unto him, Hearest thou what these say? And Jesus saith unto them, Yea, have you never read? Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise. And he left them and went out of the city into Bethany, and he lodged there. Jesus, may your word come alive to us today for your glory, by your spirit. To each one of us, in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> You 
Israel lived with a messianic expectation. And as if you remember a year ago, I happened to be going through that class and, and I took a few sermons to share about how God through the Old Testament from the very beginning was preparing them for this idea of Messiah who's going to come. And um, it's all through the Old scripture, Old Testament scriptures. It's, it's, it's just throughout. And, it, and it's, there's different levels of revelation and the prophecies. Uh, but here is one uh, that's in Zechariah 9.9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. That was one of those that said, your king is coming. When you see a man sitting upon a donkey or the colt of a donkey riding into Jerusalem that was the sign of the Messiah Jesus there, he was walking and all of a sudden he stops his disciples and say okay you two guys go into that village and this is what you do you bring that, that, that donkey and the colt here from another passage, we find out that somebody did ask him, what are you doing? He says, the master has need of, the, need of them. And they let him go, just like Jesus said. And so they bring him. And so you already have this heightened sense of, we need Messiah. Roman oppression. They're looking, and they ha they've been looking for centuries, though. During the Hasmonean period, the, the Maccabees. Uh, Joshua and some of these other guys that were fighting, trying to fight off the Romans and they, they succeeded for a little while. All of this was happening. Why? Because they wanted a Messiah to come. And there had been false messiahs that had come and gone. And some people get all excited. They had somebody rise up and, and maybe they were gifted in oratory. You know, they could speak well or they... They had this great vision, we're going to throw them off and throw off the Romans. And, and they thought, well, maybe this is the Messiah. And they would come and follow after him. And the Roman come and go, crush him. I want you to know that they had, the Romans had been following Jesus' ministry from the beginning. And a dear friend of mine, a pastor, uh, stated that there's some indication that when some unique character would arise and it may not have been just in Israel but in another nation some unique character would arise they would assign a centurion to keep an eye on that fellow because we don't want trouble here and if they knew much about Israel at all and Israel's history and if they'd listened much to the way the Jews talked they would have known this Messiah thing is a big thing and uh, so very likely, and from, from what it was stated, that centurion would stay, he would, he would follow, he would watch, he would listen to what they were saying. You wanted to find out if you had a subversive character here, you wanted to know what he was going to say, what he's going to do. So you're listening. So you, if this is true, then this man followed Jesus all through his ministry and would have remained with him until he was either out of the country or that person was dead. Very likely was part of that party that actually crucified Jesus. It was a big thing. Messianic expectation. And so they're, they're, they're watching this guy, you know, and all the Jews are watching him. This, this man, he's, um, at the, this particular time is, is so significant because the scripture says your king comes riding on the donkey. And Jesus has done all these miraculous things and people have heard about him and, and so many people have been healed and demons cast out and, and if maybe they heard about the, the storms on the, on the Sea of Galilee and this calm. We're talking waves, six to eight foot tall. 
that were extremely rough. There was something about the configuration of the, the hills around the Sea of Galilee, and the winds would come in there uh, from the direction of the Mediterranean and just whip it up a storm. Horrible storms. And Jesus stand up and said, Peace be still. And everything. The wind stopped and the waves. It was still. And uh, they, they knew all these stories. And, and now he's sitting on the donkey. And he's riding into Jerusalem. And people are excited. Ex extremely excited. And they're saying he's here. And they know. They don't speak about it too loudly. They don't talk about it in their homes and the little shops. And they, they know. This one's got the power. This one's got the real goods. And he did. He did. He's coming in the power of God. done marvelous thing Dis demonstrated divine power of the flesh and material world and that very day in the temple he was healing the blind and the lame I want you to think about that for a moment people that had not seen either for years or maybe all their life and the scales are taken away and they're seeing for the first time their families and friends going wow the lame what does it mean to be lame means that you walked one leg shorter than the other, maybe broken or maybe disformed. Jesus touching them, be healed, be well. And that leg straightening out, becoming the same on both sides. And it's what happened with John and Peter, the man that was healed at the gate, beautiful, leaping and jumping and running around, praising God. People are getting happy. So on the way here, they're saying, Hosanna to the son of David. And then Hosanna is, is if, uh, I need to clarify it a little bit, but it has this sense of, it's almost a warrior song, a statement. The king has come. We're ready to go, you know, to battle. People would have followed him anywhere. They would have stepped in line with him had he said, today, we kick out Rome. They would have jumped right behind him. Hosanna to the son of David. All of those messianic promises, your Messiah will be of the lineage of David, a son of David. They had it all together. The theology's all there. And they've got the person right in front of them. Wow. There's so much going on that even the children got stirred up. And later when they got up the Temple Mountain, he's healing people and the children are just going around shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. Praise the Lord. Rejoicing. You know, I tell you what, when adults get excited, children they get excited. There's been a real problem over time. We've seen in ministry with, with young people that the Lord is working marvelously and a young person gets all excited in the Lord and want to rejoice and want to go off for God. And the parents watch them and listen a little bit. They go to their linen closet and they pull a blanket off the top shelf. They go into the bathtub and they turn on the water. And they get it all wet and said, son, come here. And they throw it on him. Throw a wet blanket on him. Don't go too far. Don't get too excited. It's better when the parents get all excited and then the children get excited and they have a reason to get excited. My parents are excited. I don't know how many people we've seen and some of them even today are not where God wanted them to be because the parent decided to throw up a wet blanket on them. 
their spiritual work. The children are even. Things are going up, up, up. Jesus was going to set up his kingdom. I'm excited. But that wasn't what Jesus is there for. Yes, he's riding the donkey. He's going to take a kingdom. He's going to take a kingdom. But Jesus is going down, down, down. And that's a hard lesson to learn. And I want you to know, I'm going to throw this out. There's a lot of people today thinking that Jesus is going up, up, up. And they're looking for Jesus to come back again. And he's going to reign over this, these nasty, uh, sinful people. And he's going to put them in their place. And we're going to rule with him. Just like James and John. We want to go up, up, up. Be up on top with Jesus. Jesus may be calling us to go down, down, down. Even then. There's some indication from scripture that there is a realm of living in Christ that he wants us to be. And it's not on top, it's underneath. I shared a couple weeks ago about some of these thoughts. But they went to go up. <coughs> now let me ask you a question. Was Jesus capable of casting off of the Roman oppressors? Was he capable of, of building the king of Israel right then? Would he have had much trouble doing it? I mean, the people, all they would have needed to have done was just follow him and praise him. He would have just taken that divine power. And just <coughs> he could have said, repent. Or I'll kill you. And the Roman soldiers, after a few swings of his, the, the sword of his tongue, and their late loaf, would have uh, probably started repenting or running. No army, all the armies of the earth couldn't come against him. Jesus was not void of power, even as a man. He told Pilate later, if he wanted to, he could call down a multitude of angels and deliver him. That wasn't his choice. And Jesus speaks at the beginning of a high priestly prayer. As you, Father, have given to me, the Son, power over all flesh to save as many as thou hast given him. Power over all flesh. Jesus could have gone around twisting the arms of people. You believe in me. I'm God. I've got power. <clears throat> Jesus actually tells his disciples that he has the power of a death, even his own death. In John 10, 18, he says, No man taken it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment I have, right, have I received of my Father. What kind of power did Jesus have? But Jesus has chosen to use his power over all flesh in a different manner. John 12, some Greeks come to Jesus, and uh, the interpretation that I feel is probably best and I like, um, they uh, come to Jesus and uh, are wanting to see Jesus, because you remember over in Greece, during the time when Paul was there later on, they had the Aeropagus, and they would meet daily just to, to hear something new, some great new thought, some profound thought. And these Greeks had heard of Jesus and thought, boy, we can make a hit over there in the Aerobagus in, in, in Athens. Let's see if we can get this guy over there. Man, we can make some money off this guy. Or you know, at least we can offer him a place that's safe. People don't like him around here. You know, They heard some of the rumors. Some of these people don't like this guy. Let's give him an out. They, Peter and Andrew come to Jesus, I don't know if it was two of the disciples, and, and he telling them, well, these Greeks here want to talk to you. And Jesus says, our memory verse, Verily, verily, I send to you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. So Jesus was going, he was speaking at that time, and he's going to demonstrate the power of death to bring life going to demonstrate the power of death to bring life. 
And it's very significant, and, and you may think, well, I've heard some of these things before, Pastor Don. Why are you going over them again? Because I'm realizing myself that if we un want to understand the kingdom of God, they thought they understood the kingdom of God. Let's go and kick out the Romans. We're going, we're going to go up, up, up. Reign with Christ. And we realize Jesus went a wholly different direction. And we need to realize if we're going to follow him, we're going to have to follow him that way. Remember I said two weeks ago, if you want to go with Jesus, if you want to, as we're heading toward the cross, two things are going to happen. Number one, is we're going to learn that we need to become nothing. We're going to become a servant. And uh, that we're going to go down. And the second is that we're going to be persecuted. And for the carnal heart, the selfish heart, neither one of those sounds exciting. And before we can really understand persecution, the self-life is going to have to die. We're going to have to become that servant and go down. So what I'm wanting to to demonstrate to you and make extremely clear that the purpose of God through Christ from the very beginning is down, down, down. In a moment I'm going to show you how far down that goes. <clears throat> but here we are. The people are probably wondering as the week is going on, he's still teaching in, this, in the temple. Why hasn't Jesus done something yet? Now he goes in and he demonstrates some of his power. He goes into the temple and he casts them out. You're thinking, okay, wow, this guy, he's on, he's, he's on top of things. But why doesn't he, you know, he casts out the money changers. But why doesn't he do that in the Antonio Fortress where the Romans are all stationed? Why doesn't he do it over there? And that's just off the temple mount. You go out the north gate, uh, I think it's the sheep gate, at the Temple Mount, you make a left-hand turn, and there was a Fort San Antonio. In fact, there was actually some steps there, maybe right in the corner, that came directly out of the fortress onto the Temple Mount to keep there from being any trouble on there. It was on those steps that Paul was about torn apart by the Jews, and they arrested him, and the, the rest of the end of the book of Acts. <coughs> So here they are. Jesus is showing this. He's demonstrating this, but it's not to the degree that they want. The people were probably wondering why Jesus hadn't taken the reins of the wagon and gotten it moving ahead. Let's go. Instead, Jesus lies down in front of the wagon and lets it run over him. You've got to get a hold of that. He's calling us to follow him. We keep wanting to get the reins and get control. And he's calling us to lay down and die. It's very... Uh, <clears throat> and the praises for Jesus turn to questions and finally, by the end of the week, to derision and mocking. He's not satisfying them. He's not doing their expectations. One of the motivations that is given about Judas Iscariot is that he was trying to force the hand of Jesus. The Iscaro was a group of zealots, Jewish zealots. And the zealot was one that wanted to reestablish the kingdom of David in Israel there in Palestine and have self-rule, Jewish self-rule. And here, Jesus chose one of them to be his disciple. This guy is anxious. Let's get things going. And we knew he had other problems. He was a thief. He had the, the bag. and uh, We can't understand why Jesus chose him to do that, except Jesus has given us a lesson. We'll, we'll love even those that, that steal. But there's, there's a reckoning day that comes. There's a judgment day. But that he was somehow trying to force Jesus' hands. Is in a, if maybe we can put Jesus in the vice and he'll, he'll bust out of it and he'll, he'll start moving. And so he, he betrays Jesus. And now he's in the hands and thinking, oh boy, this is really good. And remember, I mean, the power of Jesus is there all along. Remember in the garden, one of the accounts gives it when they said, are you Jesus of Nazareth? And he says, I am he. And when he says, I am, they, they all fall back on the ground. 
the whole host that came to get him. <clears throat> they stand up and brush themselves off like, well, this is a little embarrassing. He says, are you the one we're looking for? Jesus. And he said, I am he. Boom, and they fall down again. No trouble. And then he gives his hands to be bound and led away. He's going to lay down in front of the wagon. But it didn't work. And Judas realized it. I'm going to turn a corner here. This theme of dying was central to Jesus' ministry in it. Um, and this dying was tied in with serving one another. Two weeks ago, I remember, I went over this. Remember Jesus washing the disciples' feet? John 13. And we can go there. I want you to look at some things. <clears throat> we're going to go to two last passages and we're going to tie them together. The Lord showed me this years ago and I don't think it's a mistake that these two passages are in here and they're laid out the way they are. The Spirit of God knew what He was doing when He was writing this. Inspiring it. In John 13. We have this 13 through 17. You call me Master and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you ought also to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done. Verily, verily, I say unto you, The servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, happy are you if you do them. So we're all familiar with that story. But how many of you really contemplated the steps in that story. And I'm just going to go through them. Number one, it, it, it references and says, Jesus, verse 3, Jesus knowing, well, it goes back before that. Start at the beginning of the chapter. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own, which are in the world, he loved them unto the end. Okay, he knows he's come from the Father. Um... Verse 3, and Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, that he was come from God and went to God. So Jesus knows who he is. He understands, this is who I am. And here's the list of things that happen after that. So Jesus is reclining with his disciples. He stands up. He lays aside his cloak. I didn't bring all these things. He takes a towel, fills the basin with water, and then he kneels, he kneels at the feet of his, each of his disciples, even Judas, and he washes their feet on his knees. What is, what is the significant um, symbolism of kneeling in, in a context with two people what? serving? Worship, honor. Jesus is down on his knees washing the disciples' feet. He finishes washing their feet. He sets aside the basin and towel. He goes back to his place at the table, picks up, and puts on his cloak. And he reclines. And it's all very significant. In a type, he did something before his disciples that he did himself earlier. Let's go to Philippians 2. Philippians 2, verses 5 through 11. I'll let you get there so you can kind of look at the scriptures and go through this. Philippians 2, 5 through 11. <coughs> Jesus starts this passage. He says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven, things in the earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord 
to the glory of God the Father. Now I want you to lay these in your mind, these two passages side by side. John 13, Jesus knowing that he came from the Father and was going back to the Father, knowing he's the Son of God. Philippians 2, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. John 13, he rose from supper, he laid aside his garment, and he went to find a towel and basin. Philippians 2, <clears throat> but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. He, in heaven he takes off the garment of his glory. He lays it aside as being made as man and becomes a servant. In John 13 he goes and he washes the disciples' feet. He serves them to the fullest extent right there and then later goes and dies on the cross. Philippians 2, and being found in fashion as a man. And the picture there, uh, if I understand this correctly, would be the best picture I can come, come upon is because boys have been boys from the day they were born. They're boys. Our grandsons are boys. You know, we have a picture of Reese holding his gun. I mean, it's boy through and through. But girls sometimes for a while, they, they enjoy playing with the boys and play boy things. You call them tomboys. But at some point, the, the tomboy, they come in to brush their teeth in the morning and they... Hmm. Hmm. I'm not a tomboy. I'm a girl. And from that point on, Things are different. I won't go into all that. That's another message. <clears throat> there is a real self-realization. I, I, of course they're a girl. They have been from the day they were born. But their mind was not wrapped up in it. And all of a sudden, there's a self-recognition. Any self-resignation to, you know, okay, we're changing directions. I'm no longer going to go out and play with my neighbor, Bobby. <clears throat> we're going to start calling him Bob, and I'm going to be Susie. Because I'm a girl. And being found in fashion as a man, he's growing up. At what stage do you think Jesus understood I have a Joseph, my father, here, but I have a heavenly father, and he's talking to me. It was at least before age 12. Because when he goes in the temple, he says, I must be about my father's business. Now, maybe he didn't have the full revelation yet, but he had a big revelation, and it was so much so that he was, he was confounding the greatest minds, Jewish minds, on the face of the earth there at the temple. He's confounding them. He's 12 years of age. being found in the fashion as a man became, he humbled himself even more. Wasn't it enough that he just became human? But he humbled himself even more. <clears throat> he picks up the towel and basin and he gets on his knees. <laughs> Get the picture. This is God. This is the eternal God, all-powerful, almighty God, omnipresent, omniscient, this God is on his knees washing the dirty, dusty feet of who knows what the feet have been in. It would be considered probably the, the most unclean part of the body in daily li living. The feet is on his feet washing. I just had a thought. Isn't that the picture of we and our sin? Our righteousness is as filthy, filthy rags. If we understood the word behind filthy, we would say that's bad. And he washes us clean. It's a picture of that washing. He's washing the feet. And then he leaves that night. He leads them out to go die. 
He rides in off of the Mount of Olives on a donkey to be king of the Jewish people and he is headed toward the cross. But he made a kingdom. He made a kingdom. And he died on the cross. And to finish off my, my illustration here, wherefore God also highly exalted him when he was done washing, he came back, picked up his cloak, and he put it on himself. And he reclined. When he got back up to heaven, he put the cloak of his glory and his the full divinity upon him. And he was fully divine here, but the fullness of of all that he was as God put it back on him and sat down at the right hand of the Father. Now what kind of servanthood should we expect? I'm wanting you to understand that God is wanting to make it extremely clear to be in the kingdom of God to follow Christ means to be willing to lose all, all, whatever this world has to offer us. Our reputation, our goods, our homes, and whatever friendships, lose all. And become a servant to all. A love slave toward those around us. To what extent should we, and look there, Philippians 2. And I thought, this is so tremendous. Starting at verse 1. If there therefore be any consolation in Christ, any consoling spirit, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the spirit, if any bowels and mercies, that's tender mercies and compassions, do you think that any of those things resided in Jesus? How much? A little? Was the cup half empty or half full? Some people say, I'm an optimist, it's half full. Was it 99% full of those? Or are we talking about absolute completeness? He was a consoling spirit. A comforting, tender-hearted, compassionate, full of love. And he had the spirit of fellowship just all over him. The, the fellowship of the spirit. That's who he was. Verse 2. Fulfill ye my joy. Paul saying, you can fulfill my joy that ye be like-minded. Having the same love being of one accord. Reverend Helm used to say, if you think you're somebody, you'll never get along with someone else who thinks they're somebody. But if you become nothing, and there's nothing in between you and the other person, of one accord, if we think we're something, we'll be busting heads with somebody sometime. It's just going to happen. If the flesh is alive in us, we're going to be bumping heads, especially with God. But if we will allow ourselves to be emptied as Christ was emptied of ourselves, and be willing to be nothing and willing to begin to serve and allow this very nature of Christ to fill us up, being of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind. See, lowliness has to begin in the mind. We can act like we're lowly and serving one another, but if our mind has not gotten to humility, we're still in trouble. Because somebody will stretch us to the point where the mind will break and we'll find out we're not the servant we thought we were. Let each esteem other better than himself. Look not every man in his own things, but every man also in the things of others. Brothers and sisters in Christ, if by the grace of God we could truly enter into these first four verses here of Philippians 2, 
the world, the environment around us would be transformed. Some of us may die just like Jesus died. They may put us to death. But we would transform the world around us, neighbors, family members. They would they'd be watching what's going on, just like they watched Jesus. And I would contend that there would be a power of Christ within us that we're not going to get anywhere else. There'd be things happening in us and through us that the world's not going to understand, but they'll be drawn to it. And this is what the world needs. Do you know how I know that this is what the world needs? Is that in God, in His divine plan to redeem humanity that has fallen and we're despicable, He chose to go there to redeem us, to love and redeem us. To allow that spirit to flow from Him every moment, day or night. Serving, giving, loving, lifting, building, encouraging, helping. That's how I know. That's what we're called to. May God help us. The world is waiting for us. They need to see Jesus alive again in us. Let's pray. Oh, Father, help us. Help us not lose this vision, but to ever move closer to you and to you, Jesus, in that spirit. Help us to be willing to lose our lives, to die to self, to become that corn of wheat that falls into the ground that dies, to allow you to mortify the flesh, uh, to come to the end of ourselves that you might be all in all in us. Help us daily to choose to follow you, taking up our cross, denying ourselves, willing to lose our life that we might find it, Lord, in you. And Lord, probably there's no greater way to celebrate your death on the cross than by voluntarily choosing our own cross and learning to love and serve one another as you loved and served us.